Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, very special thinking on um, Britain's infrastructure, which we're doing uh, in uh, partnership with EDF, and we'd like to thank them very much. Uh, my name is Matt Dancona. I'm an editor and partner at Tortoise, um, and I think we're in for a really interesting discussion. Um, I, uh, the, the title of the thinking is, um, have the UK's infrastructure priorities changed? And as I was thinking about this, I, it occurred to me that um, infrastructure is one of those very bland words or terms like marriage counselling that um, actually it, it, it's, it's bl blandness is deceptive because it covers just about everything from transport to energy provision to digital access um, to flood protection to the reduction of waste um, to renewables. I mean it's a huge umbrella term and one of the themes that we've been pursuing um, at Tortoise during the pandemic is the extent to which uh, the, the, the virus has, dis has really revealed as much as it's changed. And some of the things it's revealed, it's accelerated. So what will be fascinating in the next hour to, is to discover to what extent flaws, opportunities, challenges have been revealed. And secondarily, the extent to which those um, issues and uh, challenges have been um, accelerated or need to be accelerated. It's a very big theme. We'll try and bring some focus to it. We've got a fantastic uh, group of speakers. Um, I'm sure by now, uh, six or more months now, now into the, the process, you know the drill on Zoom, but in case you don't, um, if you wish to uh, join in, please click on the participants key and you'll see a raise hand um, button. If you click on that, I know you want to speak and join in. Uh, and more importantly, we have uh, my brilliant colleague Xavier Greenwood in the uh, chat box who will be um, uh, masterminding that. There he is, uh, good morning Zav. And um, please do chip in so that we can see what you're thinking. Um, we're really interested in what you have to say and uh, what you are uh, really trying to get out of this conversation because there are so many strands to it and it would be quite quite good to try and sort of um, distill from this, get, especially given the quality of uh, speakers we have today, some sort of um, series of principles from which to move forward. It's, it's very interesting, I, when I was um, looking at this, um, I noticed that the, the, the House of Commons Library published a, a paper at the very beginning of the pandemic, about eight days into lockdown, about, um, about infrastructure. And the tone of that was one of um, ill-concealed ner nervousness, that this was a threat to not just um, existing projects, but also to sort of basic services. There was a, there was a un underpinning uh, anxiety you could tell that the lights might go off and that uh, we might not have digital services and uh, that hasn't happened and it's interesting to speculate how 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 we got through and what we need now to do to move on what what seems to me certain is that um, the priorities have changed because the landscape has changed um, so I'd, I'd like to go first to uh, Colin Matthews, who is the non-executive chairman of the of EDF in the UK. Good morning, Colin. Um, are you there? Hi. Um, and good morning. Good morning. And ask you really just a very a very uh, straightforward and forward-facing question, which is that um, one of the uh, key kind of assumptions that was built into the very early stages of the um, of the pandemic was that the kind of spirit of solidarity that, that was evident in March, April, May and is perhaps not quite so evident uh, now in October was going to lead to a greater um, understanding and, and, and responsiveness to, um, to measures to address climate emergency. And obviously EDF's very much involved in that. 
and I suppose my 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 opening question to you, Colin, is how how has the pandemic accentuated that need to move to green energy? Um, how do we go about it, and how how serious are the efforts that are being undertaken now? Uh, you know, to be do they have a credibility that we should we should respect? Well, I think the um, the urgency, the need. Um, to reach net zero by 2050 is just as high as it ever was. And indeed, it's uh, six months more urgent than it was six months ago to get started. What's changed, I think, is the immediate need for an economic boost, which, as your intro chart suggested, um, infrastructure expending, expenditure is really efficient at doing that. If I take the energy angle more specifically, also on your charts, you suggested we needed a four times increase in the amount of renewable energy generation capacity. That's a huge amount. That's a huge increase. EDF's interested because we're a really major investor in uh, wind and other elements in the renewable chain. But there's also pretty good consensus, I think, that um, we're not going to get to 100% of the energy supply from renewables alone, or put another way, the network costs and the overcapacity that we'd need to cope with um, dark nights and windless days would be unaffordable for consumers. We need another always available low carbon electricity source. And there are lots of technologies being developed for the future, very obviously carbon capture and storage, uh, small modular reactors, uh, indeed fusion. Um, equally, there's one that's available today, um, and that is large nuclear. Uh, nuclear today accounts for nearly 20% of the nation's uh, energy generation capacity, but given the amount that's going to be decommissioned over the next uh, 10 to 15 years, even standing still on that percentage requires a really major investment. And that's why EDF is building uh, two new units in the southwest of the country at Hinkley Point. I say two units, um, and it is, and the first unit is going well. The second unit, though, is going something like 30% uh, more productively. Why is that? Well, just like in every other industry, we learn from experience. And our ambition is not to stop at unit two, but to go on and build unit three and unit four, and to do so more productively still because of the uh, learning, the experience we gain from that. But not to do it on the same site in the southwest of the country, to do it in the east of the country at Sizewell. Now, Hinkley Point is a huge project today. It's got a massive impact economically today in the southwest, also in the very nearby uh, Wales, uh, but also in our industrial um, powerhouse in the north. Um, 64% of the value of that project is being sourced in the UK. A whole new supply chain has been um, resurrected and uh, new life injected into it um, right across the country, including in the north. And the sooner we could make a decision to uh, proceed with Sizewell, the better we'd be able to sustain that uh, supply chain and to grow it in the future. Just to give you one example, since lockdown 450, uh, jobs created um, in the north, that's since lockdown. So these are jobs today. So we think that an early decision on Sizewell or new nuclear more generally is about green growth, it's about jobs, it's about leveling up, and it's ready now. And so, uh, Colin, if, if just, just to look at it from a you know, purely punter's point of view, how do I know that the electricity that's uh, keeping the lights on in my house uh, is green? Well, you need to look at the total generating across the uh, country. And today, renewables have got to, I think, around about one third of the nation's supply. That's an amazing success. It's something which I think rightly uh, the UK is proud of to have got such a huge investment into wind generation. Really successful, as I said, EDF is interested. We're behind that, we want it to happen. Um, on the other hand, it's not the whole story. And um, it is important that we get uh, going now because 2050 
sounds like a long way away, 30 years, um, but given the investments required, given the time required, we need to get going up. Thank you, Colin. Um, I'd, I'd like to move to Tristia Harrison, um, who's the CEO of Talk Talk. Chris, Tristia, are you there? Hello. Hi, Matt. I'm here. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. Um, Tristia, so, so much to talk about. Uh, I mean, one, one, I suppose, is that, you know, we're, we're heading towards a period of quite big decision uh, making, you know, in, 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 in your sector. Um, about the price of broadband and so on. Um, and, and that's happening in the context of, uh, you know, a situation where digital connectivity has become, um, if it ever was, uh, not just a luxury, uh, but, but a, a basic civil right almost. And I suppose the question I wanted to start with was how do you um, combine the extension of full fibre, uh, which is obviously key to, to, to the future of, um, of digital provision with a measure of, of affordability as you look forward to 2021. Great, well, th thanks, Matt. I mean, just, just first of all, I, I completely agree with, with Colin, infrastructure investment is an extremely efficient way to, to boost the economy. And, you know, it's a it's a very very broad subject that you're covering this morning. So, um, I mean, clearly, I'm here to to talk really about digital infrastructure um, and digi digital infrastructure investment. Um, the sad truth, I guess, about the UK is that we are woefully behind the majority of of Europe and indeed uh, global markets in in digital infrastructure. And what I mean by that is, is as you rightly say, um, access to, you know, nationwide to full fibre. Um, we in the UK have around 14% penetration today. That's versus, you know, 70% plus in Spain, in, in um, France, in Portugal, um, Italy. You know, this, this country has definitely fallen behind. Um, and as you also say, that's despite the fact this has become more of a utility, perhaps even than ele electricity, gas and, and water for sure. And clearly the experience that we've all felt through the pandemic has only compound compounded our sort of need and desire and the sort of essentialness of, of fast, fast broadband. So we are at a tipping point. We are at a very, very important juncture, I would say. A little bit more of the context, we're about to move into perhaps the biggest piece of telecoms and fixed telecoms and broadband infrastructure regulation for a decade. That, that happens um, in the spring of next year. Um, I guess the other piece, which is obvious, is that the government, um, you know, Boris Johnson personally has made a very, very big commitment to effectively ensuring that the country catches up um, and that there, is, there are gigabit, gigabit um, speeds available nationwide by 2025. Now 2025 is coming very quickly. And whilst that is an extraordinarily brave and ambitious aim, the challenge over the next 12 months really for the sector um, and for government is to make sure that that commitment remains. And my goodness, post pandemic or you know, as, we, as we start to come out of them and recover from the pandemic and build back as your title suggests, my goodness, we need to make sure that we have digital connectivity everywhere. In, in terms of your question around affordability, I mean, you know, Talk Talk has always been the challenger. We've had our ups and downs with the newest and youngest of the, um, of the four large ISPs. We serve 10 million individuals on a daily basis. We have 4.3 million premises and a big, um, big B2B business. And our objective from when we launched, um, you know, 15 years ago or so, uh, to today has been the same, which is we believe that, you know, connectivity is a right, not a privilege. It should be affordable. It should be for everyone. Um, it's an outrage, really, that we've fallen behind. Um, you know, the UK does have some of the most efficient pricing in connectivity, actually. You know, Talk Talk's played its role in that. So in terms of hybrid fibre, this thing called fibre to the cabinet, you know, the 60% of the UK has that now, which is which is fine. But what we really see is that sort of demand genie is out of the bottle. You know, and we all know this personally, and it's huge increases in usage and demand 
for fixed connectivity through the pandemic, a 40% increase, you know, and as we sort of gently came out of lockdown and now clearly we're back in lockdown, certainly where I am here in Manchester, um, across parts of the country, that usage is only continuing to rise. Of course, it's home working, you know, majority of people being asked to work from home if they can, um, but it is also driven by video streaming, gaming and all the things that we no, so there is sort of no going back in terms of the demand. We've got a very important regulatory look forward um, over the next 12 months. We've got a very you know, ambitious government on this very subject. And I think collectively we've got to make it happen. In terms of affordability, it is all the things that you, know, you can imagine uh, make up that answer. The first is making sure there's absolutely vibrant competition. You know, sadly, I'm afraid the sort of the BT, um, Monopoly over the years has meant that, you know, there hasn't been competition. We haven't invested quickly enough. That has changed. There are now some very viable competitors to BT and BT itself is very committed to investment. So that is that is good news. The second thing is making sure that pricing is affordable. And I mean, input wholesale pricing is affordable for everyone. You know, we are in great danger of fibering up Britain but actually making it for the chosen few and, and extraordinarily expensive. And I think, again, the sector challenges such as Talk Talk and government need to make sure there aren't parts of the country that are left behind. Um, and I think, you know, as I, get, as I say, we're sort of on this, on this tipping point. I mean, there's lots of talk about levelling up and building back and all those good things. You know, investment in internet connectivity, full fibre, plus that plus, um, you know, sensible, affordable pricing, which means customers take up the service, which by the way, underpins the business case for anyone building fiber, ought to be a very happy alchemy. So I think the, the um, I guess the foundations of making this, you know, catch up are there, but the next 12 months are absolutely fundamental. Um, and your point around affordability access and, and nationwide availability is a fundamental one. And ju just at the risk of, of getting lost in the weeds uh, uh, a bit early, um, but I think it's it's so relevant to what you just said. Just here. Um, BT continues to own open reach. Uh, first of all, what does that mean for the, the rest of the sector? And does that amount to a, an indefensible monopoly? Well, I mean, I think, you know, so in 2015, um, open reach and Ofcom and you know, talk talk lobbied hard on this um, for obvious reasons. Open reach for everyone's benefit is the infrastructure arm of BT, um, uh, and they serve today nationwide. So they have sort of you know mar market dominance. You, you would argue um, in 2015 they agreed that they would be legally separate from BT Group. Um, they now have an independent board, an independent CEO, um, and the real test. And you know we've been quite public about this over the last few weeks, the real test for that legally separate open reach from the rest of BT Group, i.e. that they serve customers equally, uh, regardless of whether they're part of BT or they're not, is in the rollout of full fibre. That is, that is the test, because effectively they are an infrastructure business. And an infrastructure business has a very different makeup in terms of the returns it needs, the, the significant long-term investments it makes, versus a retail business, which is much, much more short term. So there is an immediate conflict there. You know, at the time we have, we had and we have great hopes for this separation. But I think over the next sort of 12 months, the test is, is really there. And, and what we're hoping for, and we're looking for from OpenReach is a commitment to investment. I think that's absolutely there. Making sure that in that commitment, there is also, you know, a, a, a sensible environment for competition. And then really importantly is that OpenReach treats its large customers, its medium-sized customers and its small customers in a sensible commercial way. Um, and, you know, it doesn't in any sense favor a BT Group. So I think, you know, there are many questions on this, um, but what's, what we should feel optimistic about is that the bones of a plan are there and there's an awful lot of work for government, for the regulators and for the sector to come together and really make this true. I guess the final thing is, and it's the same, you know, as, as we've just heard from Colin on the EDF side, you know, infrastructure, infrastructure investments, an obvious point, brings huge 
immediate jobs. You know, we, we've, we've heard the, the piece around the, the North um, and the work that the EDF are doing. It's the same in, in digital, you know, we need people building the networks. We need people answering calls. You know, we are one of the very few sectors that didn't furlough one individual, but we didn't take any government support at all through the period. And quite the opposite, we're recruiting as quickly as we possibly can. I think an interesting stat is, you know, for somebody that has perhaps sadly lost their job through hospitality or aviation, um, you know, one of the sectors that have been most impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, they can trade in four to five weeks and be supporting building and building uh, full fiber, getting onto phones, etc. So there are significant jobs available. And my final point is, you know, full fiber is a green answer. You know, with proper fiber rather than hundred year old copper going to homes, there's less power, there's less repair, etc. So, you know, we have an exciting look forward, but there's a lot to do. Thank you, Josette. Um, and so, um, I'd like to come um, finally on, amongst our speakers to uh, Jesse Norman, uh, the financial secretary in this government. Uh, Jesse, wonderful to see you. Jesse, if you, if you don't know, is not only uh, a, a, a very distinguished politician, he's also an extremely distinguished historian, and it's uh, great to see him this morning. Um, so, Jesse, uh, lots of um, things to chew on there. Uh, We've seen during the pandemic a number of cash injections into the um, into the infrastructure program, and twelve days before lockdown, the Chancellor announced uh, six hundred forty billion pounds worth of projects for this Parliament. Um, we've learnt a great deal, I think, in the intervening two hundred sixteen days. Um, how 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 are the priorities? changing how how are the prospects of those projects some of which have been suspended some of which have been accelerated um uh faring well uh hello matt and hi everyone on this call and um my first time on a tortoise thinking and what a pleasure it is to be here and able to join you and and also to my uh fellow panelists hello so uh just to give you a little bit of context matthews you'll know uh I do tax in the treasury, but I also do infrastructure. And so this stuff fits directly into my portfolio. And within the government, we have a thing called the National Infrastructure Strategy, which we'll be publishing later this year. And then we also have two rather important but little known institutions that play a big role in this. One is a thing called the Infrastructure Projects Authority, which is all about managing and delivering major projects on the public infrastructure side. So essentially funded by government and uh, delivered by government. And then the second one is the National Infrastructure Commission, which is a independent body of commissioners who help us to set priorities and to evaluate progress. And both of those are relatively new creations. And that is because this government and its predecessors take infrastructure uh, extremely seriously. And what the Chancellor was saying when he talked about that 600 billion was laying out the scale of uh, uh, the ambition. And of course, what's sometimes not recognized is that that's not 600 billion from government, that's 600 billion of an overall package, half of which roughly is expected to come from the private sector and half from the public sector. And so it's quite important to focus on those two different things because they have a different uh, uh, ways of proceeding and different, often different timescales and a different nature of projects. And so if you think about on the public side, we tend to do things like uh, the road investment strategy, which is major highways, network rail, uh, obviously major energy infrastructure um, uh, has to be funded. Sometimes it's funded privately, which it has been with EDF at Hinkley. Uh, sometimes it's uh, historically been funded publicly through the uh, national accounts. And uh, then on the private side, we have an enormous amount of investments historically in areas like, uh, obviously, uh, as uh, Tristy was saying, uh, broadband made by private investors, but also in uh, hybrid schemes such as regulated asset based models in the water companies and the electricity companies. Uh, and so there is a there is a very interesting blend of ways in which infrastructure can be built. And in Britain, you know, we are some of the best in the world at putting together infrastructure financing to support that. At least we have been historically. 
So if you think about what building back better is better is supposed to be, it's I think it's supposed to be two things. First of it, um, uh, done faster, more effectively, and to a higher quality in the infrastructure itself, but also with much more of a focus on green uh, infrastructure, green energy, and also, of course, with much more of a focus on leveling up. That's a particular focus, as you will know, of the Prime Minister. So those are the tests that the government essentially set itself to uh, discharge uh, over the next few years. Now, what has differences to COVID made? Well, it's made a whole bunch of difference because uh, in the first instance, it had a, quite a strong effect very quickly on the construction sector because there was a concern that you couldn't do construction because you couldn't get people on site, they might become infected. And the sector reacted extraordinarily effectively actually in many ways and government helped them uh, uh, as well uh, and has really managed to pull through remarkably well considering how difficult lockdown has been on other parts of the economy. Uh, and then in other parts, uh, of course, uh, notably digital, as Tristy was saying, uh, it's been absolutely gangbusters. And uh, so that's been rather exciting to see. And I don't think it's really appropriate for me to comment on how the priorities of the government have changed because we've got a national infrastructure strategy being published in the autumn. We've also got an energy uh, 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 white paper in prospect in the next few months. And we have the interim report of the net zero uh, work that we're doing. So all of that is going to come together in the context, of course, to say nothing of a spending review. Uh, uh, all of that is going to come together in terms of articulating a direction of travel, not just the next uh, few years, but over the longer term. And if you look at the work that I've done historically, it might be trying to kill PFI when I was a backbencher, or it might be uh, trying to uh, uh, working with, with Ofcom on the separation of open reach when I chaired the Culture, Media and Sport Committee, uh, or it might be some of the stuff we're doing on taxation now. My focus is always to try to go as long term and as strategically as possible because of the steers that that gives to the private sector and the steers that it gives to public expectations about uh, the basis on which infrastructure has been built. Let me say another very couple of very quick things that might be of some interest to your audience. Uh, I take, and the IPA, the Infrastructure Project Authority takes, uh, very seriously the question of how well government can deliver. And a lot of that has simply been down, uh, I think, to uh, actually relatively poor project leadership and management on the public side within government historically. And uh, we are making strenuous efforts to correct that. So uh, we now have uh, Infrastructure Project Authority with very, very effective uh, new uh, outsourcing protocols, project delivery uh, uh, methods. Uh, we have an entire training program taking in the senior civil service. It will become, I think, very difficult to get a senior civil service job in the next few years if you haven't had actual real operational experience running something, <clears throat> uh, 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 however big or small, taking that <clears throat> equity risk, uh, if you like, in your own right. Uh, and uh, you will be amused to learn that I've even set up, I managed to set up a training program for ministers on how to become uh, better clients for uh, public sector infrastructure. Because, of course, ultimately, a bad client, as Colin will tell you, is 50% uh, uh, of the failure of any infrastructure project or any major project comes from a bad client. And if ministers aren't able to ask acute questions of the people delivering the infrastructure, um, that is to say, you know, on what basis is it being constructed? What is it really trying to achieve? Has the business case really been made out? Are we proceeding too fast? Have we done enough thinking in advance? Have we really considered the green aspects? Have we really thought about the staging and delivery of it? Uh, and then if they're not prepared to ask the right questions all the way through, are we hitting the S curve of delivery versus cost uh, all the way through? Uh, are our assumptions about valuation and uh, returns still holding? Are we taking, in the case of Crossrail, the operator's perspective adequately into account from the very beginning? If they're not prepared to ask those questions, and if they're not technically equipped to answer, uh, to ask those questions, then they aren't going to get the right answers. We're not going to get the right infrastructure delivered. So those have been the kinds of things that I and my colleagues have been focusing on as we try to uh, engineer a step change in the delivery and the quality of uh, our new infrastructure. So you've got a structure in place, you've got a strategy in place. How, but how uh, adaptable uh, are those things? Because clearly, you know, in the last six months, we've seen already uh, dramatic changes in patterns of commuting, uh, with no guarantee that they'll return to what they were 
in the status quo ante and um, a shift towards working from home, uh, both of which have, you know, as, as, as examples, huge implications for infrastructural strategy. So are you confident that the government's uh, way of approaching infrastructure is able to, is nimble enough? Well, it's of course a fascinating question. And uh, uh, you don't have to spend much time thinking about the way markets work to understand that they can change extremely quickly. And they often depend not just on economic factors, but on changes in norms, changes in expectations. And if you see the way in which people have reacted to COVID, uh, that's just doubled and redoubled the rate of change that you might have seen. At the same time, I think it's a mistake to regard uh, all of the change to COVID as a new normal. We're all obviously hoping that fairly soon we will have a vaccine and we will be able to get uh, back to some form of new normal. What that new normal is, I don't know. Certainly, uh, uh, as uh, Tristia said, uh, you know, video usage zooming and the rest of it is um, going through the roof at the moment and that's driving uh, internet uh, usage uh, very heavily and that's just one aspect of the change but I think one of the important things from our point of view is also to try to make sure that we aren't just taking short-term decisions on long-term projects I mean for example it would be very easy to say well do you know what all this zooming means we really don't need uh, to use our rail infrastructure as much, and therefore we should just wind it down in some areas. And I think that would have uh, potentially disastrous long-term effects. And when you consider that contrary to the conventional wisdom in many ways, rail privatization has been something of a success, that is to say very high levels of usage over the 20 years following privatization uh, and relatively low levels of subsidy, then that shows that actually um, if it weren't for COVID, uh, we might be using our infrastructure in a very different way. And if we're able to get over COVID, we may go back to using it uh, uh, at the same kinds of levels. And so we just have to balance the short and long term in an intelligent way to try to maximise public benefit. Thanks, Jesse. I'd like to bring in um, our co-founder, James Harding now. James, are you, are you there? Matt, thanks. I've been, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I've been messaging Matt. I can, oh, can I say something? I'm really keen. I really want to say something. Um, so, so... Here's why. So when I listen to Tristia speak, right, I, I'm sitting here this morning going, hallelujah. Someone is actually saying our situation in terms of infrastructure is an outrage. Right? Not, oh, let's make a little investment here. Let's make sure that we can sort of tighten the screws and the bolts there. It's an outrage, right? And, and, and a lot of the things, Jesse, I'd put to you that we're trying to, to, to get to grips with in 2020 when we look at deprivation and inequality and the very unfair outcomes that are playing out in this pandemic are rooted in the fact that our country is so uneven and so unfair. And yes, a lot of that's gonna sit in our education system. There are a lot of social forces, but the fundamental wiring of our economy is a massive problem here. And the argument I'll put to you, Jesse, is that no one doubts that people in government aren't working, you know, the 15 day working fortnight, the 25 hour working day to try and get through this. But I think there are two things that are happening here, um, or I should say not happening, that are really urgent. One is a, a point about communication. And we, we, we seem to be stuck in a place where we're addressing the here and now, even though we can see what's coming in three to six months, right? 2021 is going to be the economic crisis that matches the 2020 health crisis. We're gonna see colossal levels of defaults, bankruptcies, redundancies. And the government as so far has not yet put to me in a way that I really appreciate and understand its agenda on the economy. And not a slogan, not build back better, but a real nuts and bolts argument. And the second element of this is, I fear that the spending that and the borrowing that's going into job support schemes, and I'm a, in favor of actually a much stronger level of JRS than we're currently seeing, is actually um, excluding a sensible argument that says, we're gonna to need to do as much borrowing in order to put money into infrastructure, right? And we can afford it. Right? Debt service levels are low. And so part of this is a is to my mind is a is a narrative problem, a comms problem. Right. You know, when Philip Hammond took over at number 11, 
he made the story productivity. Most of us at the time didn't know what productivity was, but he made the story productivity. It feels to me as though we need the Chancellor and Bayes to make the story infrastructure and not in a sloganeering way, in a way that, as you know, as Colin and Tristia are doing, getting us to try and join the dots between the things we care about, working from home, net zero, to fundamental investments in the economy. And so, as you can hear, I feel really strongly about this because I worry that we end up with slogans and we end up with a government that comes a week late and a pound short to all of these big projects. And as a result, we keep on falling further behind other countries in Europe. And so that's, that's what I wonder about kind of quote unquote build back better is the government has a slogan, the CBI weighs in, but there's not a narrative that connects to the public and there's not a narrative that then forces the public finances and the argument through the treasury. Jesse, do you want to come back on, on that? Oh, sorry, you're, mute, you're muted. This is, the, this is the perfect sort of thinking, Jesse. What we, uh, can I make a suggestion to your muting person, which is let me mute myself and unmute, and then we will get into the, the, the mutual unmuting. Uh, so, uh, James, I completely disagree with you, I'm afraid. I think you've, you've, yeah. uh, you're making an argument that's hopeless in many respects. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, you'll be pleased to know, in the spirit of good. Thinking. Yeah, good civilized um, disagreement. Way, very lovely to see you, but I, I, I think the take this. Let me let me just explain why for a couple of reasons. First of all, I, I don't think the language of outrage is ever particularly intelligent in the context of infrastructure because uh, infrastructure is intrinsically long term, and mm -hmm. um, outrage uh, indicates an attitude of panic towards something or an attitude of disgust. And actually, the only way to solve infrastructural problems is by careful, intelligent, and ideally accelerating reform. So I, I disagree with you on that. The second thing is um, infrastructure for all its uh, uh, benefits, and let's not forget, if I may lovingly point out, Colin has a, um, a nuclear fire, uh, power station to sell, and um, I'm sure Tristia would like some help from the government on um, input pricing for broadband. So we're talking, people have dogs in the fight. This argument is advancing, and and I have to we have to understand that and 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 recognise it. Um, but when you're talking about infrastructure, actually, it's less well correlated with uh, levelling up and economic growth than skills. Uh, a fact people occasionally forget. And the government's got a very clear message on skills. In case you hadn't noticed it, the plan for jobs. Chance has been all over the issue in the last few uh, months. Um, thirdly, I, I think you're wrong about the, the, the furlough scheme. I happen to be responsible for the furlough scheme on the tax side. And, uh, uh, you know, we spent £40 billion so far. And it's extremely, and by the way, it's had a very equalising effect in many ways, I think we'll discover, um, uh, 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 because it has been deliberately targeted to try to support and protect the most vulnerable people uh, and the most vulnerable businesses in society. And... Uh, uh, I think it's extraordinarily easy for an armchair to say in an area where, well, I think we should be spending a lot more of other people's money um, when the country is already at 105 percent of uh, GDP. And we have to be careful not to succumb to the idea that because we spend a lot of money, it's therefore a good idea to go on spending a lot of money just as it were for the sake of it. We have to be very careful and thoughtful about how we calibrate that and who we and who receives it and how we tie that into future economic development. Now, it may well be true that next year is a very difficult economic year for us. And you don't have to be Nostradamus to suggest that. Um, but uh, I think the wider point, which is that uh, infrastructure is and is going to continue to be, and with careful, intelligent reform, uh, can be um, uh, increasingly a part of our re national recovery, is that's an argument that uh, we are making and we will be making increasingly in the uh, months to come. Uh, you have to understand, though, also that people at the moment are not thinking about quite yet about the recovery story. What they're thinking about is the how do we get through the next few weeks and months story. And inevitably, government, and that includes uh, senior politicians, politicians more senior than me, are going to be attuned to that. And rightly so, because they have to be able to show people a way through this in order to be able to get to the point where we can start to think about the bounce back story. Je Jesse, Matt, can I just do one thing? Just a okay, quick yeah, yeah. response to Jesse. Just a very quick response to Jesse. Jesse, I, uh, just back at you. I, I disagree with you on two fronts, right? One is, I think that one of the reasons why people 
are, are losing confidence in where we are is that they don't have confidence in where we're going. And I appreciate that the government and everyone is in the let's get through the next few weeks phase. But I really think that the country needs, certainly business needs, leadership that stands up and says, we see where we are in the next few weeks. We're also very clear about where we're going and we have a plan for 2021. Right? And, and I don't think that's being communicated. And the second thing I disagree with you about is, and this is really, this has been a kind of subject that I've tried to understand better, is this question about debt levels. Right? So I spoke to Larry Summers last week, and I was really persuaded by his argument, which is we have much more headroom for borrowing. And the worry is that we are so forged by the experience of the global financial crisis that we want to keep a lid on borrowing and we fight the last war. And, the, and, and his argument is that we, we can afford to borrow much more. It's not the you know, GDP to debt level we should be looking at. It's debt service costs that we should really be looking at in the current uh, circumstances. And that would make much more funding available. And I worry that within the Treasury, and when I hear the Chancellor talk about, quote unquote, the sacred duty to, to balance the books, that the moment is premature and the wrong sort of lodestar lighthouse for this particular government at this time. Uh, well, again, James, I'm afraid we're going to have to disagree. I think the, the <laughs> chance has been extremely clear about uh, his plan for jobs. He's been frank with people about the difficulties ahead and he has uh, uh, created the basis within the Treasury over the next few weeks to uh, articulate a further story about public spending and uh, infrastructure. And of course, there'll come a moment, uh, as there is any crisis, when uh, the government want to stand up and point to the future. And of course, that's right and rightly so. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a political judgment as to when uh, that moment should come and exactly what its components will be. Mm -hmm. uh, but the idea that the government hasn't got its eye on that or that somehow it's not making uh, intelligent long-term decisions, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of how the comms play out at any particular moment, uh, is, I think, wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. On your wider point, uh, I'm afraid I also uh, disagree. I mean, it's all very well to pray and aid um, vaunted figures such as uh, Larry, and uh, I'm an enormous admirer of his uh, in many ways. Uh, but um, of course, the fact of the matter is that uh, we are in a way fighting not the last war uh, at all, because the last war, if you recall, uh, was one in which uh, we were we were attending to the um, deficit uh, created by a 2008 crash. Mm. And the government has not uh, uh, announced uh, enormous uh, constraints on the spending in reaction to uh, the crash that we've had at the moment. Um, on the contrary, it's been very heavily leaning into that and what the chancellor is saying quite rightly in order to educate people in a long-term way and in order to remind parliamentary colleagues in spending departments is that the bucket of money which is being funded let me remind us all by you and me and everyone else on this call if they're in this country um is not uh, uh one that can be endlessly replenished uh, and so that is a very important message. And it's a message that every treasury is going to have. And it's going to have that message at 105% of GDP. And uh, those who say that the uh, uh, we ought only to attend to debt service um, uh, are, are helping themselves to a uh, convenient argument. But also, they don't have to bear the cost of the possibility that in due course, uh, uh, that might turn out not to be the case. And we'd have to pay something of the money back and or cut spending very quickly in order to accommodate higher interest rate costs. And it may be true. Larry's got a theory of secular stagnation. That's fine. I don't uh, disapprove of that at all. I think he's absolutely entitled to do that. But it is a theory. And government isn't just about theories. It's also about options across different sets of theories and different sets of possibilities. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, the need at some point to have a barred purchase interest rate uh, is one that is manifest to everyone at whatever level of GDP you're going to have. Okay. Right. I'd like to move to Davis now. Uh, Bruce, are you there? Bruce, hi. Hi, there, yes. hi. Yeah. Um, yeah, Bruce Davis. I run a company called Abundance Investment. Um, we invest into infrastructure, uh, or at least my investors do. So we've raised just over 110 million into green infrastructure. And we just completed um, a bond for West Berkshire, who's, which is the first local government green bond, uh, which raised uh, 
60 basis points cheaper than the government lending to councils. So we saved money for the council and we raised a million pounds to do some solar as a pilot scheme. Um, so I was just really sort of saying that one of the key things here is reason why West Berkshire want to do it. Warrington in the middle of their bond, got another 30 councils that are lining up to do this, is that they want to see people being more part of the equation about these sort of decisions. So I think a lot of the issues, a lot of the frustration is that people don't have enough say in how things are done or they don't have enough visibility on how things are done and therefore in the current climate they tend to distrust the decisions that are made and I think the other bit is that people don't understand government anymore as an investor they don't necessarily have any experience of that and I think on this sort of debate around debt or not I think the key thing is well what is that money being borrowed to do does it create assets for that uh, community? Does it create assets for the nation? Or is it going into uh, other types of spending? And I think at the moment, we don't differentiate enough in the way we talk about the national debt to look also at the national assets on the balance sheet. And, and I think, you know, my recommendation would be talk about the balance sheet, don't just talk about the debt. That's like measuring the value of my house in terms of the size of my mortgage, rather than the value of my house. Nobody does that. Okay, but um, we all think about the value of our house. Um, we should think about the value of our infrastructure, not just the value of the mortgage that goes on it. Otherwise, I think we do get into this sort of slice and dice kind of language. So what we're doing is we think we can do three billion a year into local infrastructure via local authorities and decentralize some of this decision making and target the infrastructure more precisely so that you're delivering solutions locally, whether that's in terms of broadband or it's in terms of energy or other things, transport that fit those local regions, rather than saying, we're gonna spend tens of billions of pounds on a particular infrastructure and everybody's gonna have it one size fits all. So I think this is the big change. I think what we can do is be much more targeted in that infrastructure rather than um, having a national plan. I think we need, we've got 300, well, we've got 400 local authorities. We have 400 local plans. Those local plans are then judged and delivered by the, the people who vote for those local representatives. Thank you very much, uh, Bruce. Uh, can, can I come to uh, Vittorio Caleo, if, if you're there, Vittorio? Uh, good morning. Good morning. Um, uh, now, I, I wondered with your uh, experience um, as a former CEO of Vodafone, what you made of the, um, the, 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 the problems facing us and they are, they are urgent in digital infrastructure. Yeah, I, thanks. I, I would speak based on my experience as former CEO of Vodafone, but also based on my experience of chairing the Italian Prime Minister Task Force for Recovery post-COVID, where, of course, we covered uh, a lot of the topics on infrastructure that uh, we've been debating. I have to be that I, I'm afraid that when I hear careful, intelligent reform, I uh, my brain uh, reads slow and reads tentative and not, uh, and not really uh, decisive. Uh, if you speak about digital infrastructure, uh, there's no doubt that we want availability, affordability, and competition, the three of them together. Availability at the end of the day is an economic problem. And uh, uh, each country, and I have to say to Tristia, unfortunately, both Italy and the UK, which are the two countries of you know, my affiliation are really behind. So it's not just the UK, there's also others which are not in great shape. And when it comes to availability, we need uh, eventually to coordinate uh, build out. And coordinating means uh, that uh, you need a single uh, uh, to optimize the funds. You need a single uh, builder. You need then to guarantee uh, open access and fair conditions for open access. And then you need, if you want affordability at a level, eventually the government needs to decide where to put some money uh, in an intelligent way, here I want the word intelligent, uh, in order to, to be sure that uh, price is affordable. And you know, if you compare prices uh, across countries, you can see that there are big uh, differences. Now, this goes to the core of the problem of open reach and BT. Um, our recommendation as government task force to government was to uh, eventually let the market play, but uh, in absence of actual commitments and results, and when I say commitments, I mean operational and financial commitments, uh, intervene directly as government. Now, uh, 
I was reading on the chat, in Europe, there's a, a tendency to intervene more directly and more as government rather than intervening, uh, creating incentives and uh, financial, uh, you know, cherries or carrots. Uh, I tend to disagree with that. But unless we tackle this issue, my guess is that uh, careful intelligence reform will really mean only a slow and remaining uh, backward and not being inclusive uh, of all geographic and social areas that deserve and have to be uh, enabled. And then, of course, I agree with the point on skills. That was the second big recommendation that we made. But the two go together. You cannot just talk about skills without infrastructure or infrastructure without skills. Thank you very much, Victoria. Uh, actually, I'd, I'd like to come back to Trist here on that um, and hear what her response to those points were. Hi, Trist here. Um, I absolutely agree. I mean, I think, you know, that it does come back to this um, sort of BT open reach question. And, you know, there is a conflict between what the two sides of the organisation need to do. And I think there does need to be both regulatory and government intervention, further government intervention on that. I, I do also think this question around, you know, very localised infrastructure investment is fundamental. It's really, really important. And we were talking just before this started around, you know, the ability for the local mayors, the local authorities to really have influence uh, amongst the communities that they, they serve. And I think that engagement, particularly in the rollout of full fiber over the coming years is, is going to be fundamental. It is going to be postcode by postcode. We're not gonna fiber up Britain nationally that quickly. So a, a localized approach um, based on, you know, local economic need, I think is, is really important and it's a bit more bite-sized it's a bit more practical to deliver um, and I think you know the, the, the combination of national and local governments working together is fundamental for this for this piece. Thank you very much Tricia. Um, uh, could we go to um, uh, Holland again? I'd like to um, before well, time is running out very fast um, but I, I'm conscious that we've dealt with a huge amount of um, terrain. I'm just interested, Colin, in your sort of overview of, 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 of some of the themes that we've been dealing with, you know, not least um, funding and speed and so on. Well, I think um, the country consumers get the best deal when there's good public policies well aligned with great delivery, whether that's delivery from the public sector or the private sector. And just to take a positive example for a second, I mean, one of the key reasons that the country is leading in uh, wind generation is because previously government policymakers put a price on carbon. That was in one sense simple to express anyway, but that's what led to uh, good businesses making good business from doing the right things for the environment. And therefore, the energy white paper in my sector is super important. And I think it's worth saying, too, that you can one can reduce some risks by delaying a decision. But delaying decisions increases other risks. And the challenge is to reduce overall and to get on with those decisions which are um, ready and, and waiting and need to be taken. So from our point of view, uh, the sooner the better on that uh, energy white paper. And then specifically to some of the points that were made uh, earlier on, um, some of the things we're talking about are long-term issues. Um, in the cases which, which are important, we need to get on with, we're behind them. But some of them are relevant for 2021 and certainly size well is, there's a whole new supply chain, a whole new set of skills which have been brought back to life from a generation ago in the nuclear industry and that's working today on Hinkley Point and it needs to be redeployed in order for that to continue to grow. And that can happen in 2021. Sizewell C is not a project that is starting from scratch. It's already had hundreds of millions of pounds invested in it. And so uh, we're keen not to take over the role of government. It's for government to decide many of these aspects, the needs of the country, and indeed how best to fund these things. Um, our case is we will respect that. Uh, we're just looking forward to the earliest possible decision because it's about jobs today and in 2021. Uh, James, I think you had a. a, a I, I just want to. I just wanted to say one, one thing, which was just about tortoise and this particular subject, um, which was 
Look, I, I appreciate the points that um, Jesse made in response, and I really think that, you know, what Vittorio said is, I suppose, Jesse, what we feel is that when we hear talk about a measured and considered approach to infrastructure, we think, oh, hey ho, we're in for not very much happening over a very long time. And, and so I suppose that urgency and that outrage is an attempt to say, sometimes you see in economic policy making the drum that needs to be beaten. And, and, I, and it feels as though in the kind of 2008, 9, 10, it was debt. It felt as though in the middle of the you know, 20 teens, we were dealing with automation and a misunderstanding of the impacts of automation. It feels certainly for tortoise, given a newsroom that's fundamentally interested in the long term, what's driving the news, infrastructure is that drum. And given that it's currently dealt with underneath a slogan that, that doesn't mean much to anyone, journalistically, I just wanted to say to people on the call, this feels to me like an opportunity. We were talking to Andy Street last week about the Gigafactory in Birmingham and what the West Midlands can do in terms of electrification of cars. These are the kinds of things where I don't think there currently is a journalism that examines and explains. It's not a free ride to infrastructure providers. There are big questions of integrity of process, of affordability and availability and competition, as Vittorio said. And there are fundamental questions about social impacts and outcomes that mean you need a journalism that takes that infrastructure development and holds it to account. But I just, I'm just sort of waving at you, Jesse, to say, I think for us, this is, there's a drum, infrastructure is that drum, and I hope we're going to keep on um, beating it. Jesse, do you want to wave back? <laughs> uh, yes, if I may, that would be great. Thanks. So very quickly, I uh, agree very much about the points about local schemes and a balance sheet view. I think I'm, I think I'm the first MP to have written calling for a national infrastructure fund that actually balanced assets as well as debt um, about 10 years ago in the Telegraph. So believe me, that's a point I get. Uh, uh, the point about, um, point Victoria made is I think, um, I mean, he, he, he was speaking on both sides of the argument. He said he deposed, opposed intervention um, across Europe um, and eventually government was needed to, uh, to do things, um, but that we should move faster. And the truth of the matter is the way you reconcile that apparent contradiction is just by distinguishing between different kinds of infrastructure. I mean, we are, I don't know if anyone's seen it yet, but go and spend some time peering if you can over the wall at HS2, that's an enormous piece of infrastructure. It gets people going in different ways, but no one can doubt that it's proceeding um, uh, 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 rapidly uh, on a very long-term project. And of course, it's consuming a huge amount of public resource as it does it. On the other hand, if you're in the telecoms business, you know, you can put up masks relatively quickly and change can occur relatively quickly through uh, decisions about pricing. And so it looks like as it were, you were in a much shorter term world. And of course, the task for government is to balance these things and to make sure that we're proceeding across a big front. I'd say to James, of course, if you want journalistically to make infrastructure a center of tortoise over the next 12 months, then by all means and longer. But um, my suggestion, and by the way, when you do that, don't forget the road investment strategy, vital for electric vehicles, twice the size of its predecessor I negotiated when I was at DFT. So again, huge amounts going on, but kind of unrecognized. Um, uh, but don't do that. I would say, I would say make skills. I think skills is a more important fa factor in the short term and ultimately more of a factor in the long term productivity of this country, even than infrastructure. So if I may nudge that suggestion onto your journalistic priority list, and if you want to come to Hereford, where we're building a piece of infrastructure focused on skills creation, which is a new kind of university, a new specialist technical uh, and engineering university. And with luck, it will open its doors in the first quarter of next year. And uh, I hope Tordis will come and look at it and um, see what local change uh, delivering both skills and potentially technical and engineering improvements in the longer term looks like. We, we surely we will, Jesse. Um, can I, uh, we've already run over time, so can I just uh, wrap things up? Just by looking, uh, looking at my notes, I realise that in this uh, fascinating debate, we've actually um, landed on a series of themes which, in fact, describe most of the key problems that are facing us in late 2020. Um, Tristia mentioned the, the, the whole question of leveling up in the digital area. Uh, Colin um, talked very eloquently about the, the whole question of sustainability. Um, Vittorio, uh, I, I felt, gave us a kind of um, 
a, a, a jump start on the need for speed of reform. Um, you know, James and Jesse uh, uh, discussed the, the question of what you know what are, what are the reasonable limits of borrowing for uh, mo modern developed nations, which I think is, is going to be one of the the key issues moving into 2021. Uh, Bruce talked about decentralization, which one only has to look at the front pages of today's newspapers to re to realize that um, uh, this is at the very heart, not only of pandemic um, uh, uh, policy, but also uh, the way that we organize our statecraft. And that in a sense, um, infrastructure is in itself a subset of a much broader debate about resilience. Um, I'd like to really thank um, Jesse and Tristia and Colin for um, providing us with such a fascinating overview of this subject and thank EDF again for being um, our, our partner in this uh, uh, splendid thinking. Uh, to the rest of you, I, I wish you a very good morning. Thank you very much for taking part and uh, have a good day. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.